Hello and welcome to Musical Pathways, the podcast which focuses on the different pathways musicians take in order to reach their goals. Today we're going to be talking to another teacher here at Musical so that you can get to know them a bit better. Our guest today is a master of many chords, an accomplished drummer all in the same stride. For his career he has been involved in many jazz, gospel, blues and rock projects throughout the world on cruise ships and even a circus and has now settled here in Cornwall and joined us here on Music L. How's it going, Jamie? Yeah, all good, Gary. Thanks for having me on. This is Jamie Fife. As I said at the top, we're going to be looking at the ways in which musicians have developed their skills and how they've reached their goals in becoming professional musicians. And while doing this, we're going to take some stops at some of the accomplishments and opportunities they've come along the way and explore them a little bit more so you can get to know them. Um, the first question I'd like to ask everyone is, what role did music play for you in your early years? Well, for me, um, a lot of people come from a musical family, and I, I count myself amongst those people. But it was a hidden music in my household, because my dad was a mystery singer. Um, so when I was growing up as a really young boy, he was basically an engineer and, uh, and a manager. Right. And, and he had this hidden ability as a singer that I didn't even know about. So I, I imagined I was growing up in a in a non musical family, and then uh, it gradually you know became apparent as I got older that that my dad had this amazing gift that as a younger man he had um, he had used a lot in the in the Scottish big bands because he's from from Edinburgh right. and he was essentially a swing singer when he was younger mm-hmm. to Blackpool my hometown and um, and decided to to put away his microphone and and try to sort of build a family and and have that security of a nine to five job and I never heard him sing in the house apart from you know quietly in the bath occasionally and it wasn't really till I was um, 13 or 14 that I became aware that they had a really quite an amazing gift oh that's interesting isn't it I'm probably from the same same ilk actually in that my I wouldn't call my family musical like my dad and my mum both love music um but i no one played an instrument in my head but now i think about it my nan has been an organist for 80 years so maybe it's kind of one of those things where it it skipped a generation down to me so i didn't really realize it but it was there like boiling in my blood in the background yeah so yeah that is really interesting and also interesting that he chose to go to blackpool a famously show place and then give up the singing. <laughs> well, he was well placed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was ideal for him when he decided, probably when I was about seventeen, to go full time as a singer, because he felt the job was done by then. And you know, I was um, at college, and then he was in the ideal location to really go out as a self contained singer, um, as opposed to his um, earlier big band days. And and um, he did very well. You know, he was a very busy entertainer, um, very much a lover of show business. Um, yeah I mean it's a show town isn't it like it's a real show town for for England I guess like you think of all the big dance acts and the the big bands that go along with that um yeah it's it's I just think it's interesting that he moved there and then put down the mic for a little while I think did he come back to it later are you saying well what happened was um for my early days I had always wanted to play the drums As, as long as I can remember I wanted to play the drums, and that that sort of um, uh, kicked in with my bad with my dad when I was eleven. He he finally bought me a kit, um, Premier Royale, five hundred pounds it was then. It was like a lot of money then, Gary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and was, was, what year was that? That was in nineteen eighty three. Nineteen eighty three. So they made a yeah, big investment, a really. And yeah. um, my dad um, had a piano in the house, and and he could tinkle away at it, and he, that was my first band, really, with him. And he would more play the piano than sing in those days. And he used to sing, a, a, play a few Scottish reels and jigs. And I'd play along with some March Dows. And then he, he had a few compositions that he'd written on the piano. And he was a completely self-taught musician, Gary. He'd never had a music lesson in his life. He was a yeah. natural. Um, and it, it was wonderful because when I was um, older and joining my first bands when I was 17, it wasn't a new thing. I'd already been in that ensemble with him. I knew how to listen and 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 how to discuss music yeah that, that's interesting isn't it that's something that equally I, i've been trying to do with my daughter you know she we've got a keyboard downstairs and she loves playing on the keyboard and just every so often i'll just go and play with her and and 
it, it's the subtleties of it. It's not a, I'm not teaching her the keyboard. She's not learning the keyboard, but it's the subtleties of music and learning to play together, isn't it? And I, I, I do think that family connection does, you know, you do connect with your family very easily musically, don't you? You know, if like if my parents are singing, I can sing with them quite easily. Or if my nan's playing the organ, I know when she's going to drag a beat out or when she's going to cut it short. And um, but th- there's no real it's it's like organics of it is making it possible. You know, it's not necessarily musical sense. I think it's like a, a family thing. But but later on, we use that by knowing the musicians in our band you know we get to know them and we become a little family and and we understand when they're going to take that extra long minimum or whatever it might be um and it's great i think that connection is is just awesome when it comes to music yeah i, I really like that word family it is it is a bit like that isn't it when you're in a unit that you really yeah. you really love you really love the people around you and um you know, and I've never really made that connection before, but I guess our first band is our family. It is. And we can take that family sense into our future bands. Uh, one interesting thing with my own sons, um, the younger one, um, we had a few childcare issues, um, you know, 18 months ago. And I was doing a lot of rehearsal with the um, Falmouth Gospel Choir at that time. So one solution was to take him along. And he was just there every week for like uh, three hours with this amazing gospel music going in his That's head. Awesome. And the choir loved him because he just started to develop this amazing um, sense of the pulse and to express it. And uh, once or twice he would he would climb up on the um, the church organ keyboard, which wasn't on. And, you know, he was, he was, you know, only two and a half then and would like end one of the songs and look around it, be all tight. And my son would be sat behind the keyboard with his hands down on the keys, looking at me saying, I made the ending, Dad. <laughs> so the, the, creating that environment is important. Yeah. But, but music is like, I, I think there is an innateness to music anyway. You know, like it exists within all of us to some point. I mean, uh, you know as a as a historian of music as well that you know early music was essentially talking it was a communication method above anything else you know so it it is within us and and i think as little kids they can just really express it with no you know they don't worry if it's good or bad they just express it out and it's i think it's amazing and i've noticed that in some of my really young students as well you know they they aren't afraid to try something um, and play and not, you know, did I play a wrong note? I've n- never heard that from a really young student. You know, they've never asked me if they've played a wrong note when we've done some improvisation or some composition. They just play. And and it's always really nice. You know, they they might play some different notes, but as we all know, different isn't wrong it's just a different kind of sound and and yeah i do think it's really interesting that i think it's i think it's very important to to instill a sense of fearlessness in our students yeah Uh, one job i've not done for a while but when i lived in cumbria um back in the day i was really the only guy who was prepared to play any classical percussion so i was i was running the percussion section for the county youth band and i used to i used to instill in all my students to make loud mistakes come in with confidence get it wrong and just have that confidence to come in and by the time we get to the gig you'll be making your entrances at the right time so fearlessness it's it's such an important attribute yeah i i had a i had a really um great bass teacher and he um he told me that um if you play a note loud enough and with enough kind of oomph behind it that you mean it, even if it's in the wrong place and the wrong key, people will believe you did the right thing. And I think that's really interesting, you know, that idea of like, you know, he was amazing. He played like microtonal fretless jazz bass. He played with Chick Corea and stuff, like great bass player. And um, But yeah, this idea of like, if you play the note, with meaning and like emphasis no one can tell you it's wrong you know because if you yeah. co- if you commit to it it is what it is it's music that's how music works it's a organic thing and although there are there is theory and the theory is good in practice it's not always right and there's probably theory that could justify your note choice if you should find it 
you know. So, yeah. so there's there's no. I hundred percent agree, yeah, Gary. Yeah, I thought I thought there's th- that sense of conviction is so important in music, and I think you're on. You know, you're onto a good thing where you do a gig and someone compliments you for one of your mistakes. Yeah, I always feel like I'm I'm playing well on that job. <laughs> yeah, it's when it's when you get the it's normally the like face from one of the other musicians. Uh, anyone who's played with like a especially in jazz, I think a gr- group of jazz musicians, they just give you like the most like screwed up face, and you're like, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good face movement <laughs> there. <laughs> so, how did you actually learn? Did your did your dad teach you then, or did you did you have a teacher? How did it go down the change? Well, I had a very a very mixed start to be honest, and um, I think I've been very lucky in some ways to have some very good mentors around me, but I didn't have a lot of formal tuition. Um, but I had a good teacher for my first one and a half years, who was a club drummer from Blackpool called Ken Bentley and the thing that's, that made him different was he was really into uh, Latin music and as you know that's something that stayed with me yeah. and also very unusually he was a drum teacher that taught all his students and um, and again you know that's something that I came back to later and I've always been the drummer that understands harmony and and, and can sort of write out a piano part and and I think that oh, all so stems he did, from him. He did he did music theory as in notes? Yeah like actual as opposed to like drum music theory or you know rhythmic music theory he did harmony it was classical music i guess we'll have a look at now you've you've kind of practiced you've had your you've had your teacher when was your what was your first gig what what was your like first band i guess well um well actually there's there's one event that i've not mentioned just before we get into that which is why i started to play the guitar Oh and, yes, yeah, um, what, yeah, yeah. What happened was I'd always wanted to play the drums um, from an early age. I could think of nothing else, but I'd never thought about playing the guitar. And I decided that I was going to be a writer. And it was it was basically running up to Christmas, and I was going to go into Blackpool Town Centre the following day to buy a typewriter and be a writer. And that <laughs> night, guy had a dream about playing the guitar. And um, the dream was I was in Tower Music, which is one of the music shops there, and there was a really amazing Stratocaster guitar on the wall. And I wanted to take down it down and play it. And of course, in the dream, I was like, well, I can't play the guitar. So, <laughs> so I woke up the next day and then I had this burning desire to play the guitar from, from nowhere at all. And That's by amazing. chance, I had money in my pocket. So I went into Blackpool. Instead of coming back with a, a typewriter, I had my first um, acoustic guitar. And from that point onwards, um, that was always like a running away in the background. And, and then yeah. for me, it's always a chance to, you know, think about theory and, and compose music on it and accompany on it. And um, when my dad was starting as a singer um, and I started to realise he could sing, it was me that was strumming away with my bar chords in, in those days. And, and I knew how to transpose the keys for him. And we pretty much put his first album um together um in my bedroom and then went into a local recording studio to um to record it from there um, is that stuff you um you learned like that harmony and theory and stuff was that stuff you learned with your drum teacher then so you were kind of you were transferring your skills that you learned from your drum teacher onto the guitar or did you have a guitar teacher as well or was it kind of more self-taught on the actual technique front more self-taught because what happened um a year and a half into my drum lessons ken actually retired and um and i was very much self-taught then till 18 um but that was quite it wasn't ideal but it did give me the skills to to be able to um find out information for myself and and to explore for myself and have the motivation to to be able to learn without somebody guiding me and that yeah. that did stand me in good stead later on, um, but about that yeah, time, I, I f- sorry, Gary, it's all right. I think it puts you in a good position where you you kind of you've taught yourself the self learning skills, so that when someone then gives you the information and the things you needed to know that you didn't know you needed to know, you're already in a good position to take that and use it effectively rather than taking it and and not spending that kind of practice time isn't it you know you, so you've, you've essentially practiced practicing <laughs> yeah that's yeah. right and it's roundabout way and i see in some of my students where they seem to have that naturally where they can they'll come back to the lesson and will have hopefully practiced what i've given them usually they have but then they'll, they'll have gone beyond it um and that's that's an innate skill in them 
Um, but about that time when I got the guitar, I did play my first gig, which was your question. And, and that was yeah, um, um, after um, I'd finished the lessons with Ken. My school didn't have any music syllabus at all. So I used to go to the other lo- local music school on a Saturday morning and there was a percussion ensemble there. So it wasn't lessons in percussion as such, just how to play in a group. And the percussion teacher had um, composed a piece for conga drums, which I, I had, and a drum kit and, and bongos. And um, and we played that at the Winter Gardens, and in in, in Blackpool, which is a massive venue, Gary, with with balconies. Yeah, yeah, I've and, been there. Oh my goodness, I was so nervous. I can't tell you how terrified I was. And, and that was your first gig? That was my first gig, yeah. And I had a massive conga drum solo right in the middle of it. And and I remember I remember thinking before the gig, surely we should have ramped up to this with <laughs> with, <laughs> with some sort of performance. <laughs> um, but I got up there and did it, and and I've still got it on video. Um, on the VHS, oh, that's amazing. and um, you know it was lovely to to get back and and, and you know I've bumped into the guy, the two guys who who I played with on that gig since then. One of them became a, a professional military bands musician. Um, so you, all three of us ended up continuing with music from from that one performance. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I I think we um we've got some contacts who've been through the military kind of band thing, and that's something we're gonna. We're going to talk to a couple of people about as well, but I, I think that um, it's amazing that one event could spring so many musicians out of it, you know. And I, I think that's the thing that um, the Cornwall Music Service does that um, really encourages musicians is they put on these big events. I mean, they're not quite Blackpool, but you know, things at like the Minac and the Eden Project and Troy Cathedral, they're going to just make these kids embed music into their life and it like this like you said it's going to be something they remember for the rest of their life potentially as something amazing they did but was that your biggest performance or have you is there a more standout performance that you've had since then not necessarily bigger but your yes. your favorite well, it's more um favorite bands i've worked with so when i i ended up um at leeds college of music studying the jazz course and um and I was very lucky to play in the, the Leeds College of Music Little Big Band, which was like a smaller big band with only three trumpets. And that was an amazing gan, uh, band, Gary. The, the players were just astronomically good. And um, by chance, I would play guitar in that band um, because it was one of those situations where I was walking down the corridor and, and these guys were getting ready to, to, to rehearse. I was like, you know, have you guys got a, a guitarist or a drummer? They were like, we've, we've got a drummer, but we've not got a guitarist. So I picked up my axe and, and then when I was playing in this band, they were just so incredible. They just had their skills together. And um, we were playing like really modern sort of big band stuff, which then was Thad Jones and Mel Lewis and, and Tony Faulkner, uh, who ran it. He also wrote a lot of big band compositions. So there was a lot of free improvisation and um, it just was an amazing group awesome. to play with. Yeah, it's, it's funny how the, those kind of things just fall into place, isn't it? You know, like it, it seems to always be the way. You you never um you never go out looking for something and find it. It just it just like kind of falls into place, like just walking down the hall. Oh yeah, I can do that, sure. But I, I think that that's another thing that is a is becoming a bit of a, a thing across all the all of these podcasts is that like if you if you take that little path, that little thing, that opportunity that's been opened up to you, then it will give you more opportunities and you never know what's going to be behind the door i know a lot of us has equally done some terrible things that have happened from the same opportunities that haven't been quite as amazing but it all goes into the process of forming us as musicians so like i said like if you hadn't have asked both of those instruments if you had just said drums it it may not have ever happened but because you said both drums and guitar you know, and, the and opportunity I still, was I still presented carry that to forward, Gary, to, to put and myself out there. But you've got to do it in a, you know, a nice sort of way. But even yeah. more recently, I, when I first came to Cornwall, I was, I was, I got involved with a touring blues band, and that was really, really awesome. A bit similar to what Jamie was talking about with his work on the folk circuit. We were, we were going out of Cornwall and 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 heading off to Rockfest. But then the 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 gentleman who was running that band he retired. And then the first thing I did was was just send out lots of little messages to everyone I could think of, all the musicians in Cornwall that I would have liked to have worked with. And not everyone got back, 
But um, one of them was Leah Adewali from the uh, Gospel Choir, because uh, I'd heard she was pretty amazing. And um, and then um, basically um, I yeah. got an email straight back saying, uh, why don't you come down and say hello? And I took my symbols with me just by chance. <laughs> and um, and then I bumped into uh, Richard Penrose, who plays piano with the group. And he had been at Salford University where my the guy who taught me in the end, Dave Hassel, an amazing drummer from Manchester, he knew Dave. So we just totally clicked. And um, within five minutes, I was playing with the group. And that Friday, yeah. I was on a gig. That's amazing, isn't it? So cool. Like, what well, what other career can you just fall into a gig like that? Like, fall into something. And you also put about um, not to go away from the gospel thing because I think the gospel thing is really cool and and different actually. Uh, especially outside of London, there isn't a huge gospel scene, so it is awesome that there is a performance down in Cornwall. But I do have to bring up the circus. I, <laughs> how 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 does one fall into a job at a circus? Well, part of it is being from Blackpool cause, because right. there is a famous circus there under the tower. And um, I was quite lucky because my dad was, was singing. I knew quite a lot of musicians in Blackpool. And, and I was planning to do music college and then basically start teaching. And these guys were like, no, Jamie, no, you've got to be a professional. You can do it. We did it. And like, we, we went on the cruise ships. You can do that. And, um, and, and that's why I became a cruise ship um, drummer it was because i had these guys whispering in my ear saying you can do it we did it you can do it and they were the same people that drew me into the circus because they were doing um they were playing in the circus right. band at the time um especially an amazing piano player from the area david windle he's just an astronomically good piano player and he was like come and dep um so i was like doing um one day a week there and it was an incredible gig for a drummer <laughs> gary because there was loads of interaction the right. drum kits right at the front of the riser the band's behind you. At that time, it was like a seven-piece band with brass. And um, there's loads and loads of cue work. So everything right. the clown does, you mark it out. Um, obviously, you've got to play the music as well. Everything that the artists do, whenever anyone catches something, there's all these amazing sound effects while playing good time. But also, you're in charge of eliciting the applause from the audience. So um, uh, you could have a tra trapeze artist spinning around on a head and no one in the audience will clap because they don't right, know that it's yeah, the finale yeah. bit where they should clap. And what you do is a cymbal roll and it's like a white noise and the whole audience starts clapping. So all the time I'm feeding the audience applause up and down with my cymbal rolls yeah. through a, a psychological reaction that, that circus people know about but, but, you know, but couldn't possibly Now you said explain. that and I, I think about the circus, all I can actually think about is like the percussion going on in the background uh, and and obviously the other instruments as well, but that, that kind of push like you, when they're walking around the, the room, you can hear that it's got that like pulse to it. There's obviously things going on there and and... It's surprising how under the radar it is, but then I guess that's maybe the beauty, you know, like like a magic act. You know, if everyone noticed it all, maybe it wouldn't be quite as um, impactful when it all kicks in. So, yeah, I think that's amazing. I mean, there's, there's not... I don't know if there's even very many circuses running now in England. So, as opportunities go, it's probably rare. The, the other gig that's round here that's um, quite similar is um, silent film work. So a couple of years back, I got asked by a, um, um, a, a piano player in the area uh, to do a, a silent film night at Lost oh, Radio right. Jazz Club. And we had all this Buster Keaton stuff. And, and she, was, she was doing all the mood music on the piano. And I was, I was marking out all the Buster Keaton gags. <laughs> um, so it was, it was the, the closest role, really, that, that Cornwall has had to that sort of circus gig. And, you know, it's... It's another thing where your um where your experience at the circus, you know, that little that little time period allowed you to do that thing afterwards and and do it well because you'd already witnessed it in the first place. I think the same's for like um a lot of kind of if you do kind of pantomimey things as well. Um, there's a few in Cornwall. We've got quite a big pantomime culture, and it's actually fairly well paid as well you know they're, they're not low budget pantomime down here and and I, I think it's a similar thing you know accenting things and doing a little slide when someone falls off the stage or whatever is that it's that kind of circus performance isn't it slapstick comedy yeah and um if if you don't catch that kind of stuff then you're just playing the songs and it, it's a bit boring yeah it's part of the art of the gig yeah 
Um, but but getting back to um, your other question about um, great bands, so that circus band was great to play in. But but when I lived in Cumbria, um, I, I had at that point been on the cruise ships for um, five years, backing production shows, and 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 um, I used to enjoy playing musicals. I, I really enjoyed the drama of it, um, and and I sort of understood you know my place, you know the supportive role. Um, but actually, when I came back off the ships, that was when I played in my best show band because I used to do a school um, 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 called Cast and Girls School, which isn't around anymore. And they had an amazing director of music right. there who had conducted the um, National Scottish Ballet. Amazing. And loads of the team, the Perry team, were from the orchestra. He basically imported them in. And everyone else was either a military musician or, in my case, um, you know, a, a cruise ship musician. And we used to do three um, production shows for the school every year and this guy was a great musical director he conducted so well he knew absolutely absolutely how he wanted everything and and that was one of the best bands i've played in yeah i think they these school productions are some schools put in a lot of work into them and and they come out looking absolutely amazing when they do that and if they're buying in like or getting in a good number of musicians as well you know it's going to be you know the next level um have you done much like show stuff then jamie have you do you do you do much like kind of theater pit work yes well you, you go through phases don't you where yeah um when i lived in cumbria the the jobs that were just flying at me were were that st- those style of pit jobs and i used yeah. to enjoy it and i'd probably do about seven a year and then I was doing a load of function work, which I know you're very familiar with, Gary, and do really, yeah. really well. But since yeah. I've moved to Cornwall, you know, there are guys that are doing that. And also I'm a, I'm a dad now, so I, I can't really be away <laughs> seven nights a week. So it's been a bit of a luxury, really, where the music that I really love, which is African-American, Latin and Caribbean music, I'm pretty much exclusively playing, playing that stuff now. And yeah. um, I think when you get older, you sort of realise you sort of gravitate to where your heart is a little bit. And um, and I've sort of been turning down the other stuff that I can do um, to sort of have a bit more fun. And I think it's as you progress as a musician as well, you, you get a bit more of a identity of what you want to do, I guess. Um, for me, I mean, maybe the function things aren't perfect all the time, but I, I really like the functions. And I, I, do quite, I do quite a few shows through the year, um, but they they tend to be short run shows, so I tend to do kind of the the five day week uh, and the, the double shows on the weekends or whatever it might be, and then and then quarter day there because it is a tie to be in a show for weeks on end. Yeah, they're the best ones, aren't they? Where you can you can do a week and then you can you you know the, you've another one in the diary a couple of months later on. It, it keeps it fresh, doesn't it? exactly yeah and and i what i really like about them is is just the interesting songs you come across when you do that you know songs that you you never would have played before and never even may have noticed or even in the song in the you know the show if you've seen it but when you when you sit down with the book in front of you and you're going through it there's just like little tunes like i know in in oliver there's this part where um Oh, who is it? One of the characters swings around a lamppost and there's the most epic bass run you've ever seen in your entire life. And it and it's on a page turn as well. So if you if you don't know it's coming, like I didn't the first time we did it, um, you page turn and there's like a run from a low F all the way up to like four octave F or something, like the highest note on your bass. And I remember turning the page and just being like, oh my God, like, and just, jumping into it but then by the end of the week i i was expecting it obviously and you really come to enjoy that little tiny you know four bar little passage um and it's amazing like you never a lot like the clown stuff you were saying earlier you would have never noticed it but it exists there and now you know it's there you can appreciate it yeah which is, the, the, i think the conversation that you've, you've drawn us to is a little bit about art and craft isn't it yeah. Where when I was um, when I was doing those shows, there was a, there was a real high degree of craft to it, and um, to, to you know to to generate the right sort of sound that would support the ensemble without um, mm. 
without overbearing, which is a big yeah, deal yeah. with drummers. And, um, and to be very strong in the transitions of tempo, you know, to be able to make all those completely safe right from the, right from the very first rehearsal. You know, um, it's, you can make a real big impact with a, as a drummer. Um, but then if I'm like, you've been playing more sort of jazz gigs recently and, and you know, down St. Ives Jazz Club during lockdown because it's the only place where we've been able to play. And there is definitely, um, you know, it's, you're into the art there and, and there's, there's, a, there's a real sense of swing on those gigs that you can't quite achieve in a show band um, you know you've got a specialist double bass player that can just lay it down like no one else and, yeah. um, and there's a creative interaction going on that you wouldn't find on another gig and um, you yeah. can explore these different roles and I think it's important as a musician to, to know what the gig is and not draw one gig onto another if you know what I mean yeah, yeah, that, that and I, I think if you're a varied musician, you you get to learn that pretty quickly. You know, like if you're going from a rock gig to a show to a wedding, <laughs> you need to be able to cut yourself in between those three different musicians and be able to kind of work around it. Is that what you enjoy about music? Then, like the the is it the performance part, like the getting to to improvise? What's your what's your favorite bit? across the board i guess i guess drums and guitar well i'm on on a gig i i i really feel comfortable on kit and percussion the guitar i i've got i found that um you know learning about music you sort of touched upon this a little bit yourself gary the journey as a musician is a journey to find yourself musically and yeah. and and um jumping ahead to what we might advise people to do one thing i've learned is is the sooner you can find out what type of animal you are you know, whether you're a zebra or a tiger, you know, yeah. as soon as you can find out what that is and you can be that musician, you're onto a winner. And there's no point prouncing around the jungle when you've got a pair of hooves trying to trying to track down. <laughs> and with the guitar, that was like what it was like for me. You know, I really realized um, that I was a good accompanist and that it was a great instrument as a second study. Um, so yeah. I'm always happier behind the drums. And um, the thing I love it is being in a great rhythm section where things are grooving and, and things and things are swinging. And as a bass player, you know that, that, that yeah, your bass can, and drums, can, you've yeah. got to find your brother who can who's on the same yeah. wavelength. And a big deal yeah, for me yeah. in Cornwall was was to locate that guy, um, or, you know, <laughs> you know, male or female, who who sort of can can yeah. generate that feel. So I love that. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean that that like feeling of groove is like the rhythm section number one underpinning i guess isn't it you know and i know as you say like as a bass player if i'm if i'm playing that role in a band like there's nothing better than a drummer that you know again like we went back to the beginning again they feel like family and you know when they're going to pull it back you know when you can push them forwards a bit you know when they're going to hit a crash and you're going to accent it with an octave or whatever you know their feels coming up and you're going to mimic the feel quite often you know i know guys who i've played for with a really long time with i can almost every time tell you the rhythmic feel they're going to give the feel before they do it you know i can feel the anticipation i can i know you know oh he's done an extra accent there so he's going to accent that in the feel or he's left that bit out because he's going to fill in a space in the next one you know <laughs> and i you, you just get to to learn that thing that you know, we're going to do a bit together here or I'm going to give you a bit of space. But also, and, yeah. um, as well as that family thing, you, you can come into a new ethos, can't you? Like when yeah. I when I, um, when I joined the blues, blues band, I was working with the Blacktops when I first came to Cornwall. Um, I remember um, doing the audition and, and I'd, 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 I didn't have much time at the time. I scratched out a few drum charts. I was a bit nervous because I was, I was turning up with my slightly smaller jazz drums and, and a piece of music. And the previous guy in the gig had had like a massive drum kit and a bandana. I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to fit in. And, um, and it was the feel, actually, that really drew me into that band. Yeah. And I imagined I'd be filling it with energy and driving forwards. But actually, they were really sat back on the beat. I was like, oh, yeah. so that's what it's like in this family. We're back, we're back there, are we? And, and that's where yeah, it was yeah. for the whole gig, you know, and you've got to sort of think, well, that's, that's how this is. And that's how I've got to be. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's that, that adaptability again, isn't it? Yes. All, all coming around. Is that what you would recommend to students as well? Like learn to be adaptable and and to play in different styles? Or are you one of those people who thinks, like I know earlier you said about 
the tiger like finding your style do you think what what's the best way of going about finding it i guess is the is the answer here well i think of it like a pyramid so when you're younger you need to say yes to everything you've got to put yourself out there and you've got to try yeah. as much as possible and you've got to find find the right teacher who can help you um and the right musicians around you that, that want to play the mm. type of music but do as much as you can and then as you progress through it narrows and narrows and you, you find out more about yourself and all that earlier stuff is still with you and you've still got those skills but you can you can start being the person who who you're meant to be you know because as a guitarist you know I, you know if i had the choice i'd probably be um you know the next john schofield um <laughs> <laughs> um but you know um you know there's no point chasing that and being another smaller john yeah. Um, you've got to be you've got to be yourself and find out find out what you do best and 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 then do that and that's when music works yeah i think i think that's i think that's perfect actually like finding yourself is the ultimate end goal i think for all of us as musicians it's it's our where we want to be at the end we want to be us on guitar and and actually i think that's probably a little bit of a thing that some people encounter which isn't wrong but it can be a bit of a barrier where they they try and be someone else. You know, you get musicians who really try to, you know, they all encompassing of the person they love, and and sometimes you just got to let that go and and be a bit more you. You know. <laughs> well, well, my dad was a very good influence there, Gary. Yeah. Uh, because he he he's a very distinctive singer. Right. He, he has got his own voice completely. And I asked him once. I said, "How did you how did you do that?" He's always been someone who hates imitators and, you know, especially Sinatra imitators. And he said, just take little pieces. That's what I did. Yeah. Little pieces from every different singer and, and put them put them together. Yeah. And um, I think that, that resonates with what you're saying. Yeah. And, and like I said, yeah, I think I think all your teachers as well, you know, take little pieces from each of your teachers, each of those musicians you really love, each of those musicians you play with. And ultimately you will you'll get to your end goal. You'll you'll find yourself. So I guess to to round this up now, um, we'll end off where we began, and and have a look at how does music really affect you now you're an adult. How how is what role does music now play in your adult life? I guess I guess beyond being part of music, L. It's just a massive role. I I, I just can't think about anything else. <laughs> and um, the wonderful thing about it is if you pursue music. It's very, very rewarding, um, perhaps not financially, but in terms of self-growth. So every day you're a slightly bigger person. And, um, you know, I'm always trying to um, develop what I do as a player. And I think if you study with the, with, with the right teachers early on, there's, there's no end to the journey. I'm still working through a lot of those Dave Hassel lessons. And, um, you know, there's, 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 there's a long journey ahead. Yeah, I, I, don't, and, um, I don't think there's ever... As, even though I said there's an end goal, it is just that. It's not an end destination. It's an end goal. And and I, I'm not sure if anyone really truly gets there. You know, there's, there's been a few famous musician deaths recently and and I think even those guys, you know, the greats, you know, wouldn't Prince. I couldn't imagine Prince ever saying that he's um, he's reached his limit. I mean, he was still making music, so I guess he still had more to put out there yes you know and they're all innovative people guys like prince are always looking for the next thing they're not um not looking maybe a little bit backwards in time but also it's it's a good idea to have a foot in the past and an eye on the future in music yes yeah, that's, that's a nice one i like that a foot in the path and an eye on the future there's a like song that. in that for you gary you can write that tonight yeah <laughs> uh, yeah uh, maybe 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 that's my next my next one I've, I've just written a song and i was so lyrically unenabled for it i just called it ambience and that way i didn't have to write any lyrics it was amazing <laughs> <laughs> it's just just noises happening it was beautiful so uh i guess that comes to the end of the podcast now and it's time to say goodbye to jamie um, I hope you've managed to gain some inspiration from this podcast and go about and grab your instrument and have a play. And remember, just as we've kind of punctuated through this podcast, every path leads to your goals eventually. So just take all of the ones that you are given. So until next time, bye. Bye.